Okay. Just execute sentence if you like. This is probably the best way to deal with politicians, isn't it? Turn the mic off. Did you hear me say? Yeah. Yeah, until it goes on. Okay. Well, it's fantastic to be here with you this morning at the fifth international conference on big data in cyber security. Oh, there we go. In cyber. So you missed the welcome if you couldn't hear me at the back. But it's great to be here with you this morning. And as was mentioned, I am the Scottish <coughs> Government Minister for Digital. Uh, and I certainly think it's one of the most exciting roles there are um, just now. And what this event highlights is the importance of joint collaboration right across every part of civic society and of government when it comes to a, positioning ourselves to make the most of the digital revolution, for want of a better phrase, but secondly, recognising that for all the opportunities, they are only as good as our cyber security. And when it comes to my role, I see there is a role for government in ensuring that whether it's businesses uh, that work currently in the tech sector and that would identify as digital businesses, or whether it's businesses that frankly don't identify themselves as being a tech business, but are increasingly having to digitize, or whether it's the public sector that's making increasing use of data, that right across sectors, there is a responsibility to recognize what the opportunities are, but secondly, to make sure that we embed cybersecurity in all that we do. And that's why it's so great to see so many of you from both um, the, the Scottish cyber community, as it were, and the international cyber community in the room today. And it does highlight the strengths of our universities and innovation centres in this area as well. And that's, of course, particularly the case for Data Lab and for Edinburgh Napier University, who have partnered to organise this conference. And I'd like to take the opportunity uh, this morning to talk a little bit about that point around leadership, about the Scottish Government's wider approach just now to big data before focusing in on the cyber security aspects. Because Scotland's digital strategy sets out our plans of putting digital at the very heart of everything we do. And it reminds me of speaking at a conference in Dublin last year and introducing myself as the digital minister and talking a little bit about what I had responsibility for. And somebody in the audience stuck up their hand and asked, are you trying to become the minister for literally everything, for eating, breathing, walking, sleeping, and all the above? And that does go to the heart of our digital strategy, which is trying to embed a digital first approach to everything that we do including the way that we pursue inclusive economic growth, including the way that we reform our public services, and including the way that we prepare our children for the workplaces of the future. And that requires innovation. And government can either be a catalyst of innovation or it can be a hurdle to innovation. But I believe that data holds the key to unlocking that innovation. And we're already fortunate in Scotland to hold world-class data about our people, about our organizations, and about our geography. We have the largest concentration of internationally significant and world-leading informatics research in the UK. And we've got a growing business sector that's driving the adoption of data science and analytics. But it's only when we bring those elements together that they offer that potential to stimulate new ideas, to grow our economy, and to solve some of the, the biggest social challenges that face public policy. We also know that when it comes to unlocking that potential, data-driven innovation can generate 20 billion pounds of business benefits to the Scottish economy over the period to 2020 and deliver potential savings as well to the public sector. And that's why it makes sense for me to have a joint role, both as Minister for Public Finance and as the Digital Minister. And digital is not just about saving money, it is about the innovation and about solving some of the biggest 
public policy challenges. And that understanding of the, the joint uh, approach lies at the heart of Scotland's open data strategy, which sets out our ambition for making data open and available for others to use and to reuse. It's why we have invested and will continue to invest in our skills base, in research and in technology. And it's a key ambition that you see in, for example, the city deals, the £1.3 billion Edinburgh and South East city deal is to make Edinburgh city region the data capital of Europe. And that's not just about the rhetoric, it's not just about positioning ourselves reputationally as caring about data. It's also got the tangible steps and strategies to make that happen. And we've provided funding to the Edinburgh-based Innovation Centre Data Lab to boost and to support data innovation right across the country. And last year, an innovative big data project led in partnership, and partnership is key in all of this, by University of Glasgow, JP Morgan, Skyscanner, and a number of others won three million pounds of funding in order to make that partnership happen. And that project will aim to develop new approaches for big data science through business and academic collaboration. So we're already seeing the benefits of such work in areas of public services, which could be as diverse as promoting energy efficiency in Scotland's housing stock, or increasing the number of people within our further and higher education system, and predicting future demand for social care. Because I see both the innovative tech solutions that are really exciting, as well as the human element of actually transforming lives, changing the way we do things, and improving outcomes for the people that will either benefit or not benefit from uh, the growth in the economy and from uh, public services. So in all of that, where does cybersecurity fit into the picture for us in government? And since I was appointed as the first digital minister last June, so I'm always coming up to the point where I can no longer say I don't know what I'm doing because I've been there a year. But in that past year, my first priority has, to, has been to get out and actually speak to businesses. And my discussions with business leaders and with academics since I took up that post have really helped understand how the evolution of cybersecurity is totally intertwined with the rise of big data. And you cannot have any of that progress without strong cybersecurity policies and implementation. But understanding how they relate can help organisations better determine what capabilities they need to develop or acquire in order to take full advantage of the data they have and at the same time keep that data safe. And da big data is one of those unique, interesting areas that is better enabled by addressing cyber threats from the outset which can also enable the detection of cybersecurity threats and generate solutions that help us to address those cybersecurity challenges. And I'd like to talk briefly about both of those areas. And again, as a politician, I've got this interesting bridge between those that are making the progress, doing the innovation when it comes to, to data and cybersecurity, as well as bridging it to the businesses and the companies and the organizations, the length and breadth of this country, that may not profess to understand these things, but certainly need our help to implement and ensure that they have strategies in place to manage their data safely and securely. Because for all that we talk about the new opportunities of innovation and big data, there are of course <coughs> numerous threats. And I realize I'm speaking to a room full of people that understand intrinsically what those are. That cyber threat is significant and it's growing, it does not stand still. And where data is of the type that cannot be made freely available because of sensitivities, big data sets can be particularly attractive targets for criminals and hostile states. And it's against that background that the Scottish Government views cyber resilience as a fundamental enabler of our digital ambitions, including in the area of big data. 
And those potential benefits will only be realized, as I keep saying, if people trust us to hold their data securely and to use it in appropriate ways. And we're explicit about the fact that appropriate cyber resilience must be built into publicly funded big data projects from the outset. It's not about retrofitting once you've built the project. It's about ensuring it's in there from the beginning. And achieving that requires the development of a genuine culture. And culture is key. It's not just about strategies or a tick box exercise. It is about culture, the development of a genuine culture of cyber resilience in Scotland. It has to be viewed as an innate part of everything we do in the digital world, not some separate bolt on that can be considered later in the process or as is far too common once something has already gone wrong. And our work with partners to help develop that culture of cyber resilience is underpinned by our cyber resilience strategy and a suite of action plans. And together those set out the actions that we want to take to become a world leading nation in cyber resilience. They start with the cyber resilience learning and skills action plan, which sets out that blueprint for government and for partners to work together to strengthen and embed that understanding of cyber resilience right across our education and lifelong learning systems and to develop a strong talent or a pipeline of individuals who are technically skilled in cyber security. One of the aspects of my job that I most enjoy and take most seriously is going into schools. And I think last time I was in this building, I was speaking to um, a room full of high school children about cyber security. And I must confess that some of them looked like they didn't really want to be there. And so I asked them the question, just to try and engage, how many of them had, that morning alone, it was only about 9 a.m., had checked Snapchat five times, hands went up. I said, keep your hand up if you've checked Snapchat more than 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. I was probably nearing 100, and there were still five girls with their hands up. And bridging from what they enjoy doing to what they feel safe and comfortable doing right now to the recognition that that is only the case because of the importance of cyber security opens their minds, opens their eyes to the critical importance of how they protect themselves, how they protect their data online, how they understand data. And then what we want to do is push them into cyber security professional roles um, because we recognize the need there. But we know that not just in Scotland, it's not a Scottish problem, it's an international problem. We know that when it comes to cyber security uh, skills uh, and the data science sector, that we are all struggling globally with a skills gap. And Scottish universities have initiated various data science related programs to meet that critical shortage of data skills in Scotland. But it's gonna have to start at the youngest of ages to help them understand the future uh, roles and, and professions uh, and to give them a, a, that, that love that ensures that they then go into those roles, understanding that within their lifetimes and even within their educational lifetimes, those skills that are required are going to change again and again. But as talent increasingly flows through the system, it's vital that those disciplines are enabled <coughs> to talk to each other and that our data scientists are equipped with a sound understanding of the importance of cybersecurity to their work on big data. So that was the first action plan. I'll combine the next three to save time, but our public, private, and third sector action plans are helping to build a fundamental understanding of cyber resilience across the whole of our economy and our society. And that's vitally important to ensure that businesses, public sector organizations, and charities all take up more of the economic and the societal opportunities afforded by big data and do so in a way that's secure. And finally, the Economic Opportunity Action Plan recognizes that every government around the world, every economy around the world 
is grappling with these issues. And if we get it right here, if we ensure we've got that talent pipeline, if we're creating and inventing the innovative solutions right here, then we have a huge economic opportunity when it comes to positioning Scotland at the forefront of these issues. Just before I, I close, having set out that context, I wanted to touch on the second aspect of the way in which big data and cybersecurity intertwine. <coughs> and that's the potential for big data to be an enabler of innovation in cybersecurity. And that really flows from my last action plan around economic opportunities, not just in Scotland, but internationally. Because one of the big challenges that we face in ensuring fundamental cybersecurity is the sheer range and number of attacks that hit our networks every day, far more than any human being could sift through to identify the really dangerous ones. And that volume is only going to increase and grow, not least, grow, not least with uh, the Internet of Things growing too. And ensuring fundamental cyber security would be difficult enough if our organisations had an army of skilled professionals to monitor network traffic and go hunting for advanced threats. But of course, the skills gap means that currently we struggle to recruit enough skilled people to do even the basic things that are needed to protect our systems. And that's where the potential role of big data in cyber security offers such exciting opportunities. And the development of, of big data analytics tools that have the capability to integrate and to process network monitoring data in real time and either adjust defences automatically or help human beings to discern the signal from the noise, allowing them to do the absolutely key things that are needed to ensure the security of networks and systems will be, could be, is going to be transformational. And so events like this, where we bring together two mutually interdependent disciplines are so vital to each other's growth and vitality. And this is a, such an important conference in that regard. And, and your approach mirrors the approach that the government is taking, not to have various and different strategies in silos, but to recognize that they are actually all interdependent. For big data to be transformational, human elements have got to remain very important. And all of this has got to grow in an inclusive way. And I'm not just saying that because I was on Good Morning Scotland this morning being taken to task on the fact that the Scottish Government isn't doing enough in inclusive growth. But it's true that with every revolution, with every potential opportunity, we can either take advantage of that in an inclusive way or an exclusive way. And inclusion is morally the right thing to do at a time where inequality is rising, but it's also the most pragmatic thing to do as well. The diverse cyber threats have got to be tackled with a diverse approach. And as well, techno, ne technical innovation, we also need more people in cyber security jobs. We need more women in cyber security jobs. Um, and I want to make sure that we are targeting people with the aptitude who may never have thought of a career in cyber security and giving them pathways to come in and to ensure that they are part of the solution. So in conclusion, as I, I do draw to a close, the opportunities in big data are phenomenally exciting, but they're just rhetoric if we don't get cyber security right. And the opportunities in cyber security are really exciting, but they're gonna be even more transformational if we ensure that we build those using big data. They're completely interdependent. And our role from a government point of view is to try and act as a catalyst of innovation. Last week I had the Danish ambassador visiting, and we've had Estonians visiting as well. And in those two countries, you see the way in which the public sector has not hindered innovation. It's acted as that catalyst. We want to be that catalyst. We've got a clear vision of where we want Scotland to get to 
but we recognise that it's rhetoric unless the building blocks are in place, which we are putting in place through our action plans. We can use Scotland's data to its full potential by driving innovation, by improving public services and by unlocking economic value, including in the field of cyber security. And never losing sight that in so doing, we save time, we save money, and in many cases, we also save lives. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, what a fantastic talk. Uh, I think it's without question that Kate is one of the most engaging MSPs uh, that we have currently. And um, really, thank you very, very much for, for your attention today. That was, that was fantastic. We do find ourselves um, with a few minutes for questions um, before our break at 11 o'clock. So I'd like to throw the, uh, the floor open to our three presenters, including Kate. Um, if you have any questions for any of them uh, that you would like to ask. Yeah, okay, so we have, um, we, we have a, a new uh, audio visual system and uh, I will make full advantage of this. So if uh, hello, it's hello. a speaker, you just speak into the top of it. And um, I'm not sure I need that really, but uh, no, no, actually, you don't. Thank you very much. Right, this is a question for Kate. Sorry, does this have a microphone inside? Yes, it's a microphone. That's wow, this is really high tech, I've got to say. Okay. So a question for Kate, um, and it's in relation to your work and perhaps our work in general with young people in schools. And um, as an ex-teacher myself, I know that stories and storylines are the things which really engage young people. So um, what, what advice do you have for us as cyber professionals yeah. to engage young people with those storylines? How can we do this right for the next generation? That's such a great question. And I'd answer it, I think, in, in several ways. The first is working amongst yourselves as professionals and with government to make sure that we are covering every school and every young person in Scotland. What I often see is a postcode lottery approach where, let's take, for example, a few schools in Edinburgh have you know, lots of tech businesses going in uh, and doing exciting things with them. And there are some schools, particularly up where I am, in the Highlands, that won't get any visits. So first of all, making sure that we are reaching everybody and nobody's getting left behind. Secondly, for me, it's connecting them from being uh, consumers of technology to inventors, creators, etc. And understanding that cybersecurity is part of that. So my little story about the three girls that still have their hands up, or five girls that still have their hands up, would check Snapchat. Do they understand? They do understand, actually. They understand what it means to be hacked. They understand what it means for their data to be uh, leaked. And they don't want that. And if we've got to take them on a journey from saying, you don't want that, you understand technology, this is how we ensure that we keep you safe, I think is the second point. Um, and, and that's the narrative around, you know, you understand technology. Now, this is a critically important part of the technology that you enjoy. The third thing is that if you go in and speak to a school, great. You'll go in for a morning, they'll be really inspired, and then they'll probably forget about you next week. If you inspire their teachers, then those teachers will keep inspiring the kids long after you've gone. And when you go in again next year, they'll remember. And I recently was, was at a school assembly where uh, it was Google had gone in to do some, some stuff on, with Parent Zone on being safe online. The kids were brilliant, primary ones who were all able to tell, identify uh, uh, you know, where, where there was risks or potential threats, whatever. And then afterwards, as the kids were all filing out, the teachers turned to me and said, I didn't know any of that. And that's the problem. The problem is actually that even teachers that came out of, the, out of university in the last few years, in that space of time, things have changed considerably. And it's about how we support our teachers to support the young people. And I think that the narrative, as you said it, is crystal clear. The narrative I've shared around, you're all consumers, how do you make sure you're safe? Oh, and by the way, why don't you want to make other people safe as well? And, and that kind of narrative. It's actually quite a simple narrative. 
Uh, but it's about reaching everybody. It's about making it clear to kids. But secondly, it's about inspiring their teachers. Does that answer your question? It does, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to pick up on a few points that Kate, Kate made, um, one of the reasons why we uh, started the Cyber Academy is to try and bridge that gap, to train the trainers. Not, not everybody is born with this information. And if you find yourself um, in need of some education around this, the Cyber Academy and its partners uh, will provide that information for you. Okay, so this is why we're here. Speak to Basil or myself or Bill, he's at the back. Uh, if there is any particular training that your organizations need, be it commercial uh, or education or, or industrial, one of the things that we are doing, and, and Basil alluded to this uh, uh, earlier, is provide additional training on a, ver a variety of topics and also technologies. So if you find yourself uh, in need of some uh, education around this, you're a teacher in education, uh, and you, you, uh, you find yourself in the position where the children know more than you do, then speak to us and we can try and address that balance. That's what we're here for. This is what we do. We're educators. Do we have any other questions for, for any of our three guests, three speakers? Oh, well, I suppose the rest too are. <laughs> 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 well, I <laughs> Question at the back. Do you want to throw the throw the mic all the way? Just just throw it on your shoulder. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it was it was on the back of the fishing. So uh, for for Stephen, I appreciate you want to uh, keep your uh, uh, various uh, providers anonymous. But I'm wondering if you can uh, tell us at all uh, whether there's any difference between the ent enterprise offerings that these organisations may have had versus uh, perhaps uh, services tailored for individuals, um, knowing that quite a few of these service providers operate in both spaces. Okay, so the, the ones that we tested were the ones targeting end users. We haven't looked specifically at the enterprise offering. So again, as part of an extension of the work, that would be an interesting direction to go. I say what we're particularly interested in in this context was the extent to which the general user is protected by the services that the general user would have access to and would make a, a usage decision around. Thank you. We've got, uh, we've got a few questions at the back. Uh, if you want to throw it towards the corner uh, at the back. Excellent. <laughs> it's getting some good use today. Hi, it's a uh, question for Kate again. Um, working in the public sector myself, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that we're very strict with our, we're struggling with our funding. So how do we kind of square the circle where we get funding to put into something such as security and digital security, um, which is not very tangible, and um, in comparison to um, the you know, obviously our more front-facing public sector kind of work. And the other element is, how do we keep our independence and our ethos of working for the public when we're engaging with larger, more um, <coughs> uh, well, private sector companies so that we're keeping our independence and ensuring that any of the benefits that we receive as a result of their input into our, the work that we're doing um, is actually received by the general public, the children, the you know um, society, and enhancing our society in, in Scotland as a whole, rather than benefiting the industries. Yeah, it's a, another good question. So I'll take them both in turn. On the first one, I would suggest that at the moment, um, and it's a point I made uh, earlier, that if we are tagging on cybersecurity solutions to systems that we are currently creating, then that's a problem. And actually, we need to be approaching all the sort of mass digitization that's going on right now in the public sector from a position of embedding cybersecurity from the outset rather than tagging it on as a solution. And that does get away slightly from your problem of seeing them. They should not be two separate budgets. It shouldn't be pitching for additional funding for the cybersecurity element. Having said that, I recognize that there are legacy systems. Uh, and, and that's where, when it comes to um, our, our suite of action plans, we have, for example, 
and this is not relevant to the public sector, but you know, voucher schemes for SMEs to be able to uh, retrofit, or as, as it were, or to understand um, the essentials, and the same goes for uh, the charitable sector. I think the biggest challenge uh, in your question is a question of leadership. Because if you're making the pitch to a leader in your organisation, if they understand that their systems are only as strong as they are secure, and they're only as good as they are secure, then it's an easy sell. Because this is not about a nice to do, this is about a core essential. Uh, would be my, my I, I get that it's hard. I get, I'm a public finance minister, I've got responsibility for budgets. It's challenging times. But these are not, is this a nice project to do or not? This should be the absolute foundation stone of everything that we're doing. To your second point, it can't get more important than taking the public with us when it comes to ensuring that their data is safe and secure and that they know it's safe and secure. And again, for me, this is a question of narrative. So I do a lot with digital participation and you get everything from, I don't want to be ageist, but a, an older granny who won't even give you her email address because she thinks that's a data breach all the way through to somebody that will tell you everything. And I think at the moment, the narrative around data is a massive problem, the public narrative, the public discourse, because it's informed by Facebook selling ads and vote leave campaigns. And actually the understanding of data, data being a force for good, is not as well understood. It's not as well understood that regularly we use data to improve health outcomes. That's a great benefit to the public. Um, and I think that if we can take the public with us, if we can be clear about what we're using their data for, uh, I think we, we, don't, we, run, we don't run the risk so much of the public feeling like we're selling out on their data. Yeah. It's got to be done in a, a safe, within a safe framework, but that's a lot easier when the public discourse is well informed by what their data is how it's actually being used, and often they're scared of things that they shouldn't be scared of, and not scared enough of things that they should be scared of. Thank you very much. I think Bill's got a final question. Yeah, I've got a, a, a question for the professor uh, from, from Norway. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in this void just now with uh, Brexit, where we don't know where we're going. And as someone from Norway, who is sitting outside the EU, you talked about your forthcoming EU project, and I wonder if you have any advice for Scottish universities <laughs> and SMEs, not about Brexit, but how we can make sure okay. that we are a core part of uh, uh, the Horizon programme. Uh, I, I didn't really catch your first point, but we, we will take that up. Uh, it's about Brexit. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, Norway is, of course, outside the European Union, but it has a privileged relationship with the European Union. And uh, being myself uh, a Greek, so part of the European Union, and not in a privileged relationship with them, I think I can well, quite accurately and objectively assess that it is much better to be in Norway than in other situations. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of Brexit, uh, quite the contrary. Okay. But there is still life, even in research and in horizon outside of the European Union. Um, you see, the, well, coming to this particular thing, yes, of course, we do take part. Uh, I mean, Norway takes part in, in horizon. Um, Norwegian universities are not very, uh, well, they are reluctant in getting involved with Horizon and European projects in, in, in more general setting, simply because funding from national sources is much, much easier and much less bureaucratic than every, any, European, uh, any European project. So why should we bother uh, writing all these pages to get the money, if you can get them, of course, for the proposal, and then all these deliverables that you need to submit for the project. When you can get the same amount of money by writing only 10 page proposal and having no deliverables at all, apart from your scientific publications, yours and your students. But of course, 
there is a question of money involved. So Norway pays its share into the framework project and therefore it's uh, quite uh, natural that they would like to get their money back. And uh, this is why in several uh, universities, uh, Norwegian university strategies, there is a very specific goal of attracting uh, Horizon projects. In NTNU right now, I think we are running something like 130 projects in, in, uh, in Horizon. Five in my own uh, group uh, alone. So, uh, yeah, well, uh, there is a tendency, of course, in the past uh, couple of years to avoid uh, having British uh, entities act as uh, coordinators of, uh, of projects, uh, but not as partners. And we will, of course, be happy to continue working with you in whatever way you eventually decide to, <laughs> to, to create a relationship with the rest of the European Union and with the EFTA countries. <laughs> Is you. that, uh, did I answer thank the you. question, thank at you. least partially? Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to our three speakers. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we now have a coffee break. Um, please bear in mind that the lectures are split now between the Riadi and the Lindsay Stewart, which is upstairs. So please do make sure that you're at the right track. If you don't have a, a sheet of paper telling you what speakers are up next, you can get one at uh, reception and uh, they will tell you. But the, uh, the speakers start at 11.30, so please make sure that you're on time. Thanks very much.